This video is brought to you by StarCharge, the largest EV charging manufacturer in the world. They are also a provider of residential and commercial battery storage with microgrid solutions. This video is also brought to you by ChemPower, the reliable, quick, and scalable EV charging solution for everyone and everywhere. Hello and welcome to another Out of Spec Reviews video. You join me in rainy Austin, Texas in the middle of the night with a Tesla Cybertruck and this is the first of many videos to come on the Tesla Cybertruck as we attempt to demystify what the heck this thing even is. We're very lucky to have one of the very first delivered customer models uh, in our hands for about four days full of testing and it all starts right now. Now, I have driven down from Fort Collins, Colorado from the office to here in Austin because one of my friends took delivery of his truck. I'll leave all of his information in the description below. I truly can't thank him enough for letting us use this Tesla Cybertruck. We are gonna be conducting range tests, charging tests, towing tests, off-road tests, this versus Lightning versus Rivian versus Hummer EV, you name it. We are going to attempt to cram it in over the next four days. However, it all starts with this video right here, which is a full tour of the Tesla Cybertruck. I'm gonna show you front to back, including the software, every single little thing about this truck. And of course, you can imagine every day as time goes, assuming we can get the videos edited, we will be showing you more and more things as we learn about this truck together. So it's the start of Cybertruck mania here on Out of Spec. It's not gonna be a short video. They're all gonna be long videos, super in-depth, super nerdy. We're going all in on the Cybertruck. Let's go figure this thing out together. It's the freaking Tesla Cybertruck and I'm here to bring you on a full tour. Uh, before I do that, again, I wanna say a huge thanks to the owner. The links will be in the description to his Twitter page. Highly recommend giving him a follow because of course, after we're done with it, he'll have it back and share plenty of uh, you know his adventures with it along the way. So I'll leave Ben's information in the description below. But a huge thanks to Ben for letting us use his dual motor, all wheel drive Cybertruck. And on that topic, most Cyber trucks, at least up to now, which is the first week of 2024, have been the dual motor variant. When I was just at the factory for the, the delivery event of the series production models, most of them were the tri-motor Cyber Beasts, but it seems like other than that initial run, they've all been dual motors. That's just my impression. I don't know that to be true, but uh, you know, I, I spoke to a bunch of Cybertruck owners and pretty much all of them have this dual motor foundation series truck. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot of history with Cybertruck up to this point. I was at the original unveil of the truck when uh, Franz broke the windows on it, which was a really interesting time. It rolled out on stage and I was like, what the heck is this ugly thing? Is this a joke? You know, we all had those reactions. And then, of course, letting it soak in. I'm like, OK, maybe it's weird. I don't know. I'm not a design guy. You know that. But I was like, oh, that's actually like kind of cool. I love weird cars. This is kind of weird, kind of neat. Uh, and then, of course, I saw the first series production model in person at our Tesla showroom in Colorado, in the Denver, Colorado area. And we all you know, made a video about that. And we were like, damn, this is cool. It's awesome. And I certainly understand if people don't like it. I get it because it's so out there. I wouldn't say it's beautiful, but I'd say it's interesting. That's just my opinion. You can have yours. And I thought that was great. So after I saw it for the first time, Colton and I, Colton, who runs the Out of Spec Detailing Channel, again, highly recommend you to check out the Out of Spec Detailing Channel because Colton's on a plane coming down here to detail, not this one, but another Cybertruck, and experiment with the metal. So subscribe to Out of Spec Detailing if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But I had my chance to, uh, of course, go to the delivery event, see the vehicle, but I never sat inside of it until today. This is my first time opening the door and sitting inside. I, I sat inside like a half put together pre-series release candidate in a video, but this is next level. And basically what I want to do is bring you around for my first impressions of the Cybertruck, tell you all of the specs, walk you through, show you everything about the vehicle. And... Um, I think before we get into all that, it's important for you guys to know where I'm coming from with this review, which is uh, a lot of people who don't watch this channel who are just interested in Cybertruck, I don't just review Tesla. I own Tesla. I've owned Teslas for a really long time. Uh, I have a Model S Plaid and a Model 3 Performance, so obviously I, I like the vehicles. I love EVs, but I hold no Tesla stock. I hold no automaker stock. I'm not here to make the Cybertruck look good. I'm not here to make it look bad. What my goal is through these series of videos that we're going to produce is just to present the truck 
with as much accurate information as I can and let you, the viewer, make up your own mind about each area of the, of the truck. Um, you know, being someone who's been able to drive every, not every single, but pretty much every single electric car on the road, um, I have a pretty good basis of understanding how this thing will stack up against the competition. And I've even arranged the competition in a later video uh, that we're gonna be filming in a couple days to go head to head against all of them, even off road and towing, so that we can really just get some raw numbers on this thing but i it's important for I, I assume a lot of tesla enthusiasts and stockholders watching our content to understand i'm not here to make this truck look good and there's a lot of things off the bat i can tell you that are not good and i will of course bring those up as those happen but then there's some things that are just truly amazing and next level and unlike any vehicle i've ever experienced and that's what we're going to do in this video is dig into this so that i just wanted to lay that out up front so you guys know where i'm coming from in the next 10 or 15 videos that we have on this none of our content is short it's always in depth and uh okay enough of that let's get into the cyber truck and i think we really should just start by going around on a full circle i was going to say up front but i haven't shown you guys the back yet so come join me this thing is crazy i've been calling it the triangle on wheels like i said we've had it around austin texas just for the last few hours i still have not driven it but uh francie's been driving it and it's just been <laughs> i don't know francie how would you describe it I, it's almost like we can't the amount of people and the amount of accidents that people have almost caused to look at this thing even here in austin texas has been crazy. Now, I've been lucky enough to drive some really spicy cars and unique vehicles uh, through my years of reviewing cars, and nothing, truly nothing, has gathered attention like this one. And even from other EV drivers, Rivian drivers going like out the window, thumbs up, taking videos, Lightning drivers, super into it. And that's the thing that I think we don't do a very good job of on the internet to just the general car community is it's a very harsh place in the comment section of YouTube videos, TikTok videos, Twitter posts about this car versus the competition. I called it a car, it's really a truck, but this truck versus the competition versus others. And to be honest, in person, when you meet people, everyone's just nice. We're all just car people. We're interested in other stuff. I took this by the GMC dealer today so I could put, take a picture of it next to the Hummer EV and ask to use their vehicle. They were so cool. They're like, hell yeah, you can use our Hummer EV. And like, this is so cool. Can we sit in it and check it out? I'm like, this is what car culture is all about. So I think it's important to take a step back, appreciate we all are into cars. It doesn't matter which one, as long as you love what you drive, that's what I care about. And this has really generated some attention like I've never seen before including a lot of, a big unexpected was, maybe I live in a bubble. If you come on down this way, you can really get this interesting side view. I think the side view is actually the worst view of the truck. I think it just looks unproportional, a little bit weird. But um, we got a lot of people today who have never heard of the Cybertruck. Actually, over half the people I talked to today, and we probably talked to 40 or 50 people just being at parking lots, trying out different chargers and other stuff while we were preparing for our video series, just a little pre-research on it. And it, first of all, it takes you a long time to get anywhere because anyone's ask, everyone's asking about it. That will wear off as it does with every vehicle, I think. But so many people never heard of the Tesla Cybertruck. And to me, that's just like, how could you not know? I just, we just must live in this bubble of automotive. And so this, there's so many people who have never heard of this thing, which is really shocking to me, actually. I would say over well over 50% of the people we talked to had no idea what the heck this thing was. They're like, one dude was talking to me about he knew it was bulletproof, but he didn't know it was electric. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Okay, enough of that. Come around to the front. Let's open this thing up. By the way, the whole material, the look of the car, one of the big talking points of the truck is the stainless steel. I believe one and a half millimeters, plus or minus, it's either 1.3, 1.8, but it's not the three millimeter thick panels that we originally thought it was going to be. And that's fine. I mean, it, it looks great. It does have a little bit of, hollowness to it when you touch it in certain or knock it in certain places unlike here where this is really solid this is quite boomy just depends on the size of the panel but the nice thing is we've seen people like matt watson at car wow kicking the door and ramming shopping carts in it and uh, certainly if i ever get a cyber truck you know i'll shoot it i don't care we'll do whatever we you know i think it'd be cool to have like a wrap full of bullet holes but it's not actually bulletproof the truck the windows aren't the tires aren't this is only bullet resistant and only for a not so powerful uh, firearm so you know pfft. I don't recommend you go and shoot your truck, but I'm also a YouTuber, so what do I care? I think it'll look cool. Um, anyway, opening up the front trunk. And interestingly, I'll show you the app for the vehicle in a moment, but there's actually a little 
latch for it somewhere right in the middle. And it's hard to find at first glance. Yeah, once you get the hang of it. So I guess you gotta come up from down yeah. here. Uh, it's 101,000, I can do this. It's $101,985 right there for a Cybertruck Foundation Series dual motor all wheel drive. The Foundation Series is $20,000 upcharge from the $79,900 base price. And what do you get for that? The early trucks are all Foundation Series. Well, first of all, you get some laser etching or some kind of etching into the metal. You get the 20 inch all terrain tires by Goodyear, which this is a, um, I actually know some of the engineers at Goodyear that worked on this tire. They were saying it's just was an amazing challenge to get this thing done. And maybe we can even do something with them to talk about the tires for this one. Uh, pretty impressive that a 35 inch tire, at least on the tri-motor one can do, a th what is it, 130 mile an hour top speed. This is like 112 plus or minus. And uh, that's just crazy to me. And just riding passenger seat in it, how quiet they are on the highway is, really next level tire, but you get those. I think you'll get some accessories, like maybe a light bar that will come in the future. This one's not installed. There's a vehicle to home uh, solution where this vehicle supports bi-directional charging. Sounds like someone just had a major accident over there. I don't know what's going on, but um, we'll talk about all those things as we go. But the foundation series is like, basically the trucks just come fully optioned. So you're not getting $20,000 worth of nothing, but you are, forced into having to buy an upcharged truck at the beginning, which, you know, I think is not unusual. You have your washer fluid right here. So if you come on in, I can show you some of these things. After I show you the front, we'll get into the nerdy details, but here's your fill for the washer fluid. There does not seem to be any filter in there like some cars have. Um, so no filter here. Behind this panel is the HEPA filter. And, and by the way, we're also gonna do an upcoming video. So comment below on this one. We're gonna do a video answering all of your questions about the Cybertruck. So if you want to see the HEPA filter, if you want to know how high it goes from lowest to highest suspension, if you wanna know what the wiper looks like at full speed, well, we'll probably put that in this one because it's hilarious. Um, you know, these are, we're gonna do a whole video answering your questions because I really wanna make sure that we demystify as much as what you're curious about with the Cybertruck. And again, it's gonna be long in-depth content. Now to close the trunk, I should be able just to push the release button right here. It will come down latch in and pull itself tight, which is great. I'm not gonna get into the build quality on this particular truck. I'll leave that to Colton. He'll have five cyber trucks here tomorrow to actually evaluate the differences of production models. And I think they're actually all customer delivered production models. So we can get a sense of that, but we'll leave that to Colton on the detailing channel. You have the world's longest series production wiper on a vehicle, which is just crazy. The thing is like a giant wet noodle. I mean, it's absolutely insane. It uses almost one kilowatt of power and uh, it's actually a double wiper on it, which is really interesting. So if you guys come up over here and just take a look underneath, you'll see that there's actually two strips of rubber underneath this thing, which is kind of cool. And uh, is that true? I feel like it was true on the one of the trucks that I looked at, but this one only has, no, this one only has one piece of rubber on it. Huh. I definitely saw another Cybertruck that had two is it missing one or does it just have one? It looks like it almost might be missing a wiper. Maybe not, hard to say. We'll have to do some more testing. We have other cyber trucks to confirm this with. Like, that's why I'm saying we have to figure these things out together. But uh, big wiper goes really freaking fast. I will insert a clip now of the first time we used this earlier today where we watched it go. And I was sitting in the passenger seat. I haven't experienced it from the driver's seat, but by the time it comes past you and you're in the passenger seat, it's got some speed on it. It's just wham, goes right by. It's crazy. Take a look. Go for it. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, it's so fast. Go. The camera can't even pick Full up how fast it is. Holy <laughs> smokes, whoa. I know I'm nerding out about a windshield wiper, but it really is kind of cool. And uh, what I'll probably do is go even more in depth on this wiper because I've, I've started to understand some of its control logic, why it stays down sometimes to prevent water from coming up uh, in a future upcoming video about everything, probably in that everything we know about Cybertruck or to answer your questions, I don't know. So let's get into some nerd stuff. I wanna talk about the battery pack first. And um, the battery pack in this particular one is 123 kilowatt hours, I believe gross capacity. Tesla never really makes a distinction between gross and usable. For those of you who don't know, most battery packs have two ratings, one which is the total installed capacity, and then most automakers take some buffer top and bottom so that you can't leave it at a full true 100% charge, or if you run it all the way to zero, there's some buffer 
I'm not sure what the usable is. We will certainly find out in an upcoming video where I'm gonna run this thing from 100% to dead at 70 miles an hour in a range test, and it will die probably on the side of the road would be my guess, and then we'll trailer it over to the charging station to zap back up. Should be kind of interesting because I wanna know how much energy we can pull out of this battery pack. But it's using the 4680 cell, which is um, you know sort of the bigger cells from Tesla. This is the second product that they've put the 4680 in, except maybe the Semi uses it, I don't know, but the second series production model. The Tesla Model Y from Giga Texas here uh, used the 4680. And to be honest, that car was kind of a flop. They've actually already canceled that car. And it was one of the worst charging electric cars, Tesla or not, of uh, the past couple years. I mean, it had a pretty good peak down low at zero, wham, shot up. And then, wow, the curve was just so bad. And, and you know, all the Tesla people, everyone early on was like, oh, it's just the Gen 1 4680. It'll get better. What about all the people that bought that one and are dealing with terrible charging experiences? I don't know. Uh, but this is the Gen 2.3 cell, I'm told. And my understanding is most of the battery packs from Cybertrucks are coming half, I don't know the exact ratio, but my understanding is about half from the Cato Road uh, Fremont facility and half from here locally built in Texas. And uh, this one was actually built in Fremont, the truck that we're uh, using here. And uh, again, 123 kilowatt hour gross. It's the Gen 2.3 4680 cell, so it's a next generation from the Model Y. So I'm hoping for improved charging speeds. I'm hoping for a better charging curve from what I'm seeing, from what I've tested already today. It's looking, well, we'll do a whole video on it. It's not terrible, but it seems to be uh, maybe up top, not what we were hoping for. Again, some of these things can be improved through software over time, but we never know what it will be improved and how improved it will come. So we just have to evaluate the truck as it is today. And of course, cover the stories as it improves in the future, hopefully. Um, so the battery pack, pretty cool. Uh, this particular one being the dual motor Cybertruck. Actually, uh, each version of the Cybertruck uses one permanent magnet motor and then a induction motor. In the case of the tri-motor version, the Cyber Beast, that's actually two induction motors. So bear with me for a second because the motor layout's actually kind of hard to explain or to, to understand totally. But let's, uh, this is the dual motor one. So in the rear of this dual motor is a permanent magnet electric motor. Now, a permanent magnet electric motor basically has the magnets baked into the rotor and that means that they're typically a little bit more expensive but more power dense they uh, are a little bit more efficient of course uh, but the one downside the main downside of a permanent magnet motor and depends on how it's implemented and how you control eddy currents and back emf and all these super nerdy things but essentially the main downside is you can't shut them off and so typically when there's a permanent magnet motor in an electric car, I like to see a front induction motor, or at least on your secondary axle, a induction motor. In this case, the primary axle is the rear axle of the Cybertruck all-wheel drive, the dual motor version. And when I mean you can't shut them off is if you're cruising down the highway, uh, there's actually some flux-related losses that happen in the motor. And we talk about this when we do all of our range testing and everything. Uh, but, a, but a really good combination is to have a motor you can either shut off or disconnect with a clutch. Uh, famously, Tesla has the clutch disconnect on the Tesla Semi. And the only car that runs all permanent magnet motors from Tesla is actually the Plaid drivetrain from Model X and Model S. Those are all permanent magnet without a clutch disconnect and we see how that car suffers just a little bit in the EPA cycle versus the long-range equivalents. So it seems to me that Tesla was really trying to eke out every last drop of juice on this particular one where in this case when you're cruising down the highway and if you need the hard acceleration that rear permanent magnet motor is giving you the juice. The induction motor up front of this particular one is a larger motor is my guess. I don't actually know the sizing difference, but it should last, uh, you know, they're both gonna be lasting a long time. Tesla drivetrains are just awesome. They're just gonna run and run. I know that from experience on my Model 3 with 150,000 miles on it, still rips as hard as it did on day one. It's just amazing. Um, the induction motor up front can basically shut off and the truck will operate as a rear wheel drive vehicle most of the time, unless you have a slip on the rear axle or it needs to blend in the front motor or a hard throttle request. And there's different ways they can tune it. They can tune it so that at low speed, it's always all wheel drive. So you have always maximum launch in low mu conditions if it's slippery outside. So the all wheel drive version, great. And I actually think this is the version most people are gonna go for. 600 horsepower, 4.2 seconds zero to 60 or 4.1 seconds zero to 60 plus or minus. Um, uh, it's plenty fast and just, again, riding in the passenger seat today with Francie driving around, 
I mean, you don't really need any more. Do you want more? Of course, because it's a crazy truck, give it a thousand horsepower or something stupid. And that's where the Cyber Beast comes in. And the Cyber Beast has a completely swapped around drivetrain system. Rather, and um, maybe actually before I tell you about the Cyber Beast, I just want to mention one thing that we'll talk about when we do off-roading. This vehicle has mechanical differential lockers on it, and it has a electromechanical differential lock on the front and rear axle uh, so that you can actually lock the wheel speeds together. We'll go all nerdy in depth. We've actually done a whole episode on the Out of Spec podcast talking about the drivetrain options, really in depth, really nerdy, but I wanted to put some of that in this video. In the Cyber Beast version, the front axle becomes the primary axle in terms of a cruising axle, but it becomes a permanent magnet motor on the front uh, with a physical mechanical locking differential up there. And so I guess, I don't know for sure, but I think the rear motor of this one becomes the front motor of the Cyber Beast. I would imagine they would do that just to save cost. Probably needs a little bit different gear ratio or something, but yeah, why not just reuse the motor? I don't know that to be true. I can't wait to dig into the parts catalog. In the Cyber Beast, the rear motor now becomes an induction system. And it's actually two motors. So it's a tri-motor Cyber Beast uh, right there. And actually the left and the right motor are no longer mechanically linked. So you have the option and the ability for full torque vectoring. And uh, I just think it's a really interesting situation to develop an entirely new rear powertrain for the Cyber Beast. Uh, that Tesla didn't have in their lineup. I thought they were gonna use a plaid drivetrain in this thing, that was my guess, reduce cost, speed up production, but um, yeah, per perhaps the, the you know, I, I don't know what the decisions that led to it were, but they decided to make the, their own new rear motor for this particular one, uh, for the Cyber Beast, and then we get a dual induction system, and that's the one that can go zero to 60 in two point something seconds, and it's insane. And I just wanna make a note about the Cyber Beast. All of the reviews that we've seen on YouTube, the fantastic uh, videos, I'm not sure if we should call them reviews or not, but I really enjoyed all of them. The Top Gear one, Car Wow, Matt, Matt Watson, Marquez's video, and of course, Jason Camisa's from Haggerty. Those were all fantastic pieces of content, all on the tri-motor variant, where most every Cybertruck that I can tell, just by talking to people and figuring out, is currently of the dual motor variant, and the tri-motor one will come at the, the mid, or second half of 2023. So we really aren't sure, and we haven't really seen, or 2024, excuse me. Um, we haven't really seen what the heck the dual motor is all about. And I'll be walking you through that together. And then of course, when I have a chance to drive a Cyber Beast, which is the one I would wanna buy personally, cause I'm an idiot and like to go fast in giant triangles, metal triangles on the road. Uh, yeah, that would be, uh, we'll, we'll be able to cover that at the time when it's possible to do so. The weight on this particular one being the dual motor all wheel drive, is uh, 6,600 and a bit pounds. Not as much as I would think it would be. It weighs less than my Rivian. I daily drive a competitor to this one, a Rivian R1T. And I think less than the Lightning or maybe a little bit closer to the Lightning, but crazy. You would think that it looks huge. It's actually shorter than an F-150. I mean, it's just, it's sort of a mind warp being around this vehicle because it looks so big. And then you park it next to an F-150 and you're like, oh, okay, it's actually kind of like a normal, normal sized vehicle, has rear steering, currently only active up to three, three and a half degrees, something like that. But soon uh, with a software update coming, it should activate up to 10 degrees of rear steering, which matches Mercedes EQS SUV and some others as well. So not necessarily class leading, but it definitely should have it. Rear steering is magical. And even with the three, three and a half degrees it has now, it's really fun watching that rear axle move around. And of course, when I get into my first driving impressions, I'll talk about the differences uh, of everything. And of course, go deep into the steer by wire uh, system. There's so many technical components to dig into on this particular one, but let's just continue with the tour uh, and maybe give you some more tangible information before we dig back into some nerdy stuff. If you could bring the phone just a little bit closer so we can unlock this thing. There we go. There's the bed coming down. And just to let you know how these buttons work, there's three buttons here on the back of the truck. You have the back one, which lowers the tailgate. It is only uh, lowered with the button or with the app. It's not a power operated up. However, you'll notice this tailgate doesn't really sit flush. Okay. And what's happening here is there's actually got to be a spring or some sort of strut that and it's not on these two, you know, sort of metal cables here holding it up, but there's something that's keeping some upward pressure here, which means I'm literally gonna take two fingers. Actually, I could probably just take one finger and close, <laughs> c 
crazy. Just close the tailgate. Um, on my Rivian, this is a two-handed operation. Now, I should also mention on mid and high spec F-150 Lightnings, this is a power tailgate completely. And I actually really like that because on those, you can just kind of lift them up a little bit and boom, they come up. This does have a soft close function though. So if, if you come in close, just so the viewers can see this one, I'm just going to lightly close the tailgate and you'll see, boom, it just gets sucked right in, which is really nice. Just give you one last look at that soft close here. I'm just gonna, again, get it right to the latch and then it sucks itself in and locks it. Soft close is nothing new, but uh, great that it's here on the tailgate. I think that's just such a nice feature where if you're not gonna go all the way and put a motor in it, that upward force just makes it honestly so much nicer than having to <laughs> lift the tailgate up every time. Now, some other interesting things on this particular one. The tonneau cover, looks pretty freaking epic. And I actually wanna take this through a car wash, a high pressure car wash, and see just how waterproof it is. Cause at least on my Rivian, it's not very waterproof. Um, and I'm gonna hit the up arrow. You can see it does an express open when I click it once and bam, it goes all the way up, comes down revealing the rear view of the vehicle, which means when the tonneau is closed, there is no rear view out of the Cybertruck through the physical glass window. And we're gonna do a video where we test the efficiency with and without the tonneau open and closed. So just giving you some hints as to what's to come because I think it's actually gonna be a pretty big hit on this particular one from an airflow perspective. So it means that you really gotta get used to that digital rear view mirror. And of course, I'll show you how all of that works. A little bit more into the tonneau cover. I can of course do an express close. Oh wait, maybe I already did, hold on. There it goes. One click, express close. By the way, beautiful lighting inside the bed here really nice led strips not just one or two but the lighting the entire bed that is so nice to have one thing i wish the cybertruck had that it really doesn't is some sort of scene lighting so many times i'm hooking up my trailer or i'm i don't know doing something it's nighttime and it's actually a feature that the lightning has uh, that and maybe we should mention it when we do the comparison test but the the scene lighting of just lighting up everything around you is magical this does not seem to have anything like it of course you can leave the the uh, headlights on which will light up the rear in red at least and, and maybe that'll work more on the tonneau if i push and hold the tonneau button i think you have to come back again because the truck keeps locking my phone is set up as a key um hold on there we go yeah if i push and hold it, i can start and stop it at any time so boom, stop it right there. Now, why would you do this? Um, maybe there's some airflow benefit with running with it halfway. Perhaps it's sort of like go as far as you can without it actually stopping. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, could, could, be, could be something. But uh, you stepped too far away again there, Francie. Gotta get closer for that phone key. And then there we go. Hold on, why won't it express close now? There we go. Yeah, just open and close buttons. You'll get used to them. Nothing super crazy cool. The one thing I will say is I have opened and closed this tonneau a bunch. It is solid. It is precise. It is so nice. You can, of course, stand on it. We've seen other reviewers do that. I'm certainly not wanting to slide off of this thing or damage Ben's truck in any way, but it seems like this is really a solid piece of uh, material covering. And it's just so nice to be able to put things in the bed and lock them in. Okay, so that's just the tonneau cover. I feel like we spent three minutes just talking about this. This video is gonna be crazy. Um, Let's open this thing up all the way and let's come on down here. There is some underfloor storage in the Cybertruck and we have it full of our crap right now. And so perhaps when we do the Ask Me Anything, we can show you what this looks like completely empty, but it goes deep. Uh, we cleaned out the interior with all of our filming gear and laptops and whatnot and, and stuffed it back here. And that's just to show you how much room is truly in this underfloor storage. The one thing I would have loved to see back here, which is actually something my Rivian has, is a rear spare tire. And what's nice about the Rivian R1T is it actually holds a full size, full, you know, full all-terrain size, 34 inch tire. In this case, it would need a 35 um, in the underfloor storage. I'm not sure why Tesla didn't make that a priority, especially with a vehicle that I would think would be designed for adventure and off-road and excursions, why there's no built-in spare tire option. I think that's really actually kind of a miss. And so Tesla will sell you an accessory, which is like a strap with a cover for a spare tire. And, and really all you have to do is throw that in your bed. And now your accessories, <laughs> your, your bed space is decreased because you're just carrying around a spare tire in the back. And honestly, for off-roading and adventures, that's what I would do. I would want to have a spare tire. I can't tell you how many times having a spare tire has uh, helped me out in the past, especially if you're going to be doing any crazy wheeling and just snag a rock the wrong way or do something. You never know what's going to happen in the middle of nowhere. You got to be prepared. 
I think that's actually a miss on this particular one. Uh, so much to continue talking about on the bed. I also want to mention, if you take a look down here, there's some great um, tie down points all throughout the truck. I wonder why the uh, lights shut off on this thing. Let me see if I can open the door. There we go. Just had to unlock it again. And just great tie down points. There's four main anchors, just like this one here in the bottom corner. Basically these uh, D rings, if you will. Do they pop out? They must pop out. This one's like jammed in there. I almost need to use like a pry tool. Let's see if we can get this one to come out any easier. Yep, yeah, there we go. And maybe if I come at it from the same angle on this one, yeah, there we go, got it out as well. So these things feel super freaking beefy and uh, just great to tie down any load or anything like that. But even cooler than these, which is where I'd probably put most of the weight on the tie downs if you're strapping in motorcycles or uh, something like that. Some Surons in the back of this would look really cool. Um, you have these awesome sort of um, additional tie down points. Now this particular one is a bottle opener, which is kind of cool. So if you're out camping or hanging with your buddies, you can crack open some Michelob Ultras and celebrate with your cyber truck. But right here you have a sort of T-channel lockdown switch. So I don't know if you can come and zoom in on this particular one, but you can see you can adjust the point through this entire track system and slide it forward and back. And I think that's uh, of course a really nice feature just for ultimate flexibility. You should also be able to mount any kind of adjustments or accessories all throughout these mounts which i don't know if any have been released yet but i think on the tesla website they will show you all of the accessories and those will be there we're not done with the bed because there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do back here as well including power and uh, i don't know if those come up on camera pretty well oh they do we have two NEMA 515 outlets and we have a NEMA 1450 outlet this is epic so one of my favorite things about owning my electric pickup truck, my Rivian, is being able to have a 135 kilowatt hour battery pack that I can bring with me anywhere. It's a mobile giant power station. The problem in the Rivian is I'm limited to only 120 volt outlets. And you guys know me, we're always reviewing cars out in the middle of nowhere, doing range tests, running stuff to zero. How cool would it be if I could have a truck that could actually charge at 40 amps continuous on a 50 amp circuit to output power? And I think it's just over nine kilowatts you can do through that port. Uh, which is pretty amazing. So we are going to be trying that. I brought an EVSE, a mobile connector that can do 40 amps continuous because the Tesla one can only do 32 amps. This one comes with an updated um, mobile connector that allows for uh, the power sharing function. But uh, yeah, no, not much to talk about there. Functionally, it doesn't look too different than the, than the previous one. It's just black instead of silver. It's just an updated design as far as I can tell. But uh, yeah, how about that? You get a NEMA 1450. The F-150 Lightning also has 240 kilowatt port on their vehicle, but I think it's only 7.2 kilowatt output, 30 amps plus or minus. This is the next level. This is what EV owners want. This is what we're all used to. This is the correct port. No stupid dongles to charge another electric car and tripping circuits because you didn't derate it. We got a freaking NEMA 1450. And of course, I'm gonna try and max it out, see what happens when we put a full load on this thing and maybe even let it run overnight charging another car. Really stress test the power electronics on this particular one, which is awesome. So. What else should we say about the bed? There's a range extender thing that might come in the future that's supposed to lay back here to give you more energy. I think we've already done a whole podcast on the range extender battery. It's not available today. It's just a sort of you can pre-order it type thing. I think it's not my favorite idea on the planet. I think it's going to be a little bit of a pain for service centers to lift a 1200 pound maybe 100 mile plus, or so. it should be about 40 something kilowatt hours, 50 kilowatt hours in the back of your truck. We've, we've done plenty of podcasts on it and plenty of videos on it, not worth talking about it much at this point. And uh, it just is not here today, so we can't review it. Let's not put it in. I don't think many Cybertruck owners would go for the range extender. I personally would just because I want the most amount of range while towing, and you guys know I tow all the time. Um, but it, it's just gonna be a, a, a reduction of payload capacity, a reduction of space, and uh, increase in cost. I'm not sure how it'll charge. I'm not sure how the thermal management system works. And Tesla has been very quiet on that particular one. Come around here to the side. Let's talk charging since we're already talking battery packs. I already let you know about the 123 kilowatt hour main high voltage battery pack. The way that battery pack is set up is in 
essentially four sections. They are in four, again, I'm using plus or minus because battery voltage is never constant and it changes across the discharge curve. For example, it could be 600 volt dead or 900 volt full. I have to check the operating voltage range of the Cybertruck and trust me, I will. We will know all these things by the time I'm done with it. But there are four bricks of roughly 200 volt nominal sections of the battery pack, basically wired in series to increase and double the voltage each time, or I should say to add 200 volts each time. So when you have the entire truck operating in series mode is how the service mode explains it. I'll show you that here in a moment. Uh, then the truck is roughly an 800 volt system architecture. Now what's interesting is Tesla's charging infrastructure is not 800 volt system it, or an 800 volt uh, operating range. The maximum any supercharger installed today at the time of this recording can do is 500, 500 volts. And I think it's actually like 467 or something is what it actually communicates. So how do you actually charge this thing? And by the way, all the commenters will be saying, well, version four is the thousand volts. Trust me, version fours have not been installed yet. We've only seen the dispensers, the post, they're taller, they have the longer immersion cooled cables, and it sounds like we've only seen the first generation, those will actually get improved. But those, at least today, at the time of this recording, on January 3rd, is it, Francie? Something like that, second, second, third? I don't know, we're into 2024, it's something like that. We're not sleeping, we're filming Cybertruck stuff. Uh, it is, um, yeah, no, no version four charger has been announced. So anytime you plug this truck into a high output supercharger, it actually has to split the pack voltage. So you'll hear a ka-chunk, and I did it earlier today, it was really interesting. You plug it in, contactors click, and then you hear a ta dunk And then the truck actually splits the battery pack from 800 volt to 400 volt. And they basically run in parallel, two separate battery packs versus in series. This is not the first, or I should say, it's actually the first series production vehicle to do it in this way, but there are three notable vehicles on the market that also do this. Hummer EV is one of them. It does it in the opposite way, actually. Hummer EV is a roughly 350 volt nom nominal operating system while driving. And then when you plug it into a high voltage charger, it actually doubles the voltage, goes up to about 700 volt nominal, maybe just above that when it's fully charging. And the PPE system, like the new Porsche Macan Electric and the Audi Q6 e-tron that are coming, also do it in this way. They, the Germans call it banked charging. It's an acceptable term. Here they call it split pack, but essentially it just means that rather than relying on an onboard booster of some kind, like Lucid has to and Tycon have to, uh, they will actually just split the battery pack so that the charger can match the voltage and dump in the direct current. Have I confused everyone yet? I hope not because we have a lot of nerds watching this channel. I know we'll also have a lot of non-nerds watching. And if you're curious more in depth on all of these topics, if you really want to understand it, we will leave in the description. We've done podcasts really different digging into all of this stuff, of course. Um, okay, when I plugged this thing into a supercharger today, bear in mind, I'm gonna have a full charging video on this. I saw 712 amps. That is the most I've seen. It was at 10%, it wasn't even dead. So I'm guessing we'll see over that when I do the zero to 100% charging test on this thing. And I haven't top charged it yet, so I won't comment much on the charging performance, but that was just a ton of amperage at fairly low voltage. Again, we'll have a whole the whole deep dive on all of this stuff, but it charged really well. It sat at 250 kilowatts till 25%. What happens after 25% doesn't look so good, but I haven't tested it for myself. So I'm gonna be bringing it to many different chargers that are empty, that we can make sure the batteries are at the correct temperature so we can truly log the charging curve. There's a lot of talk right now before we dig into this that maybe the Cybertruck doesn't charge that well on DC. Well, if Model Y 4680 is any indication, if any of the early charging tests of this truck are any indication, it looks pretty bad, but of course we're gonna test it. So I don't wanna to draw to any conclusions at the moment. And my fingers are crossed as someone who wants to, you know, who really wants this truck to succeed, I hope that Tesla gets the charging performance underway. And I also brought this truck to a high power CCS fast charging station today. Uh, it would not charge. First of all, the CCS adapter doesn't fit. Uh, which is kind of curious, but then also the CCS adapter from Tesla is only rated up to 500 volts. So maybe it's a safety thing and they'll have a specific thousand volt uh, connection point for a, a different adapter coming in the future, perhaps, I don't know. But I actually ripped the whole panel off the side of this thing. We unscrewed it and I actually made it interface and connect and it communicated, but then the truck indicated that it failed a charge. I'm gonna be bringing it to a third party NAX charging station in a future video as well, uh, which will be a thousand volt capable with a thousand 
volt inter, uh, interface. For those who don't know, 500 volt and 1000 volt NACs have a slightly different uh, plug interface here, inlet port. So we'll be making sure it's all accurate and we'll see if the Cybertruck will accept the 1000 volt inlet and see if that works. Because many people don't understand this, it's really concerning that the truck would not charge on CCS infrastructure because NACs, North American Charging Standard, J3400, now done by the SAE, communicates on ISO 1511-2 protocols, which is CCS language. So the, the adapter is dumb. Essentially, I plugged in a NACs charger to this thing and it didn't work, which means that the Cybertruck doesn't support NACs. It only supports Tesla's bespoke charging. That's fine if you only go to Tesla superchargers. And of course, these can all be updated through software and I'm sure it will be. But it's just really funny that the Cybertruck is not NAX compliant or capable. <laughs> it's still the old school kind of Tesla can communication uh, back and forth. I think I'm really digging too much into our charging video to come, but this is the stuff that I love. I'm not actually sure how fast the onboard charger is in this one. Should we take a look really quick? Let's go. It's cold out here, by the way. Hop in. I'll hop in the passenger side. There's still some more I want to talk about on the outside, I think. Yeah, suspension, some other stuff. But I, we do have to do the AC onboard charger because there's two ways to charge an electric vehicle. One is through AC, which is using an electric vehicle supply equipment, EVSE. And that is um, where the truck itself does the charging power. And that's done through a power conversion system or a, or a power control system, PCS, which is sort of in the penthouse of the battery pack on this particular one. And we should be able to see the maximum amperage that we can pull up if we come here to charging. Yeah, it's only a 48 amp onboard charger. To me, that's a bit weak. Even back in the day, Model S, so even the original Tesla Roadster supported 72 amp onboard charging. Model S then supported 80 amp, well, 80 amp onboard charging. They used the two 40 amp onboard chargers uh, together. That was actually kind of a cool option. If you ever find an old Model S with 80 amp onboard charger, that's the one to go for because one can fail and you can still charge at 40 amps. Kind of a neat trick. Um, and then later on in Model S, they went to a 72 amp slash 48 amp, and then they ended up killing the high onboard charger, the high power one. My guess was to save cost in vehicles as Tesla supercharging network advanced and you could really go on long distance without the need of high power AC charging. That's great, but I also feel like as someone who uses an electric truck every day with a similar sized battery pack, with similar sized range and similar sized efficiency, I think we'll do all the tests. Um, the 48 amp limitation on my truck feels a bit weak. And for something that costs a hundred thousand dollars, especially, you know, this is the base one at a hundred grand that you can get today. I would have loved to see a, a, an 80 amp onboard charger would have really been great. Um, seems like Tesla's really trying to not go the high power AC charging route. Most of their home equipment now is limited to 48 amps maximum. The early wall connectors could do 80 amps. The ones that I have actually can do 80 amps and I have them wired as a power sharing situation or a split, um, you know, to, to share the power available, but alas, worth checking it out. And that's, it's totally fine. 99% of people will be fully charged by the time they need to leave in the morning. But if you have a farm, if you have a ranch, if you're going to be working with these things out in the middle of nowhere and want the AC charging power, you're limited to about 11 kilowatts or so on this particular one of home charging. Then of course, low power DC is coming along, but the CCS adapter doesn't fit. Oh, well, okay. Lots of little nerd stuff here to continue. Let's go outside. There's so much more I want to tell you about in here. <laughs> wow. The cyber truck francie can i just get a quick impression from you as to what you think about this particular one here's the mic okay. just before we get super nerdy yeah i mean this is my first time seeing the cyber truck and i think it's really cool it's obviously super different looking like you said it attracts attention and you can really see why it doesn't look like anything else that we've seen before i think we're just really trying to learn how different it is and how exciting it is compared to just how new it is. Um, so yeah, driving it around was really fun. The steer by wire is totally different, but very uh, intuitive. I think my brain just adapted really quickly that, oh, small input, big output, no problem. Uh, so yeah, I think it's really cool. I love learning all the nerdy details from you and yeah, I'm excited to see all the charging and everything going on underneath the stainless steel exterior. Thank you very much, Francie. Appreciate that. Um, okay, back to the video now in terms of nerd stuff. Um, we've mentioned powertrain. We haven't really mentioned thermal management system yet. This one uses a heat pump with sort of an octo valve technology or maybe even more now. I'm not sure what they're up to, but Tesla, the one 
when I think about Tesla, it's kind of weird, but the one thing that I think about their core competency in, of course, is charging infrastructure and being able to deploy. And everyone on the supercharging team really is just honestly wiping the floor of the entire industry. They are building some of the highest quality chargers, putting them in some of the coolest places and providing a great charging experience for EV drivers of all makes and models starting now in 2024. But the next thing I think about with Tesla is thermal management. Uh, the thermal management of an electric vehicle is the most important thing to efficiency other than, of course, shape and aero. Thermals are key to providing a great charging experience on long road trips, while towing, while using the truck hard. And I have not really done too much with this truck yet, but I can already tell you the preconditioning logic was right on point. And it's a day one truck, basically. It's, a, a, it's only had one software update since new, and it's a very early build. And it's like, damn, they just get the thermals so right on this thing. The cabin heat rips. It's so hot in there. The AC system rips. They have nailed this. And actually, one thing that's kind of interesting, speaking about the cabin heat, I've never experienced this in a vehicle before. We were just moving around here, filming it, I don't know, getting it all staged for this shoot here. And it was so cold outside. It actually feels like it's warming up almost, or I'm just getting excited about the Cybertruck running around. Uh, we had the heat on full blast in this thing, and it's melting in the car. I mean, we had it nice and warm. I opened the doors and like there was a rapid depressurization. Both Francie and my ears like popped and we were like, oh, that's weird. And then we closed the doors, let it repressurize, pop the doors open and poof. It was just like your ears, you feel the pressure change. So when we talk about like having great air quality in a vehicle, which is important to health and everything, this has, they Tesla claims, we should really verify a lot of this. I think it's fairly accurate. They have hospital grade HEPA air filters in here and it keeps the cabin pressurized without even using their bioweapon defense mode, which is just so cool that a car has bioweapon defense mode. Whether or not it works in a bioweapon attack, I don't know. I just love having the button. I have it in my uh, Model S, and it's just so hilarious to have that, uh, that function in the car. But truly, even in my Model S, especially in the Model X where that car's kind of leaky and stuff, this thing gets pressurized. The build quality of this, in terms of noise performance on the highway, how everything, you just feel like you're sealed in a cabin, um, pretty next level. And I actually think maybe that's not great. Most cars actually have a little overpressurization vent, usually in the rear bumper, so that you don't get this pressurization effect in the cabin. It's not a desirable effect, but it does lead to showing just how well sealed this vehicle truly is. Okay, enough on HVAC, suspension, steering. I already mentioned the three and a half degrees of rear steer. We do have independent suspension on this one. We do have air suspension on this one with many different ride height modes. We have low, we have entry mode, low, medium, high, and extract. Five modes, up to 17 point something inches of ground clearance. We're of course gonna dig into all of that as we get into the off-road modes. As I talk about driving it, I'll talk about the different drive modes, but so much suspension changes. And the one thing I've really noticed, especially coming from my Rivian, which has a extremely sophisticated suspension system, way more so than even the Cybertruck. The Rivian has uh, hydraulically actuated, infinitely variable uh, roll stabilization, which this just uses physical sway bars as an example. But but um, the Rivian takes, you know, it has like an air tank, every electric, you know, every uh, uh, air suspension has a pressurized air tank. The Rivian, when I raise it up, lower it, raise it up, it gets like one or two different adjustments and then it runs out of air in the tank and then has to run the compressor and it just takes forever to raise back up. This, you hit a button and woof, bam, you're at the ride height. You drop it, boof, down, you're all the way. And it's so smooth and it's so quiet and you don't hear it happen. Tesla went all out on the air suspension on this particular one. And I believe there's 420 liters of air holding capacity in this particular uh, situation. The air chambers, especially on the rear of this, I've been able to see them when I was at the factory, are massive. And what that means is you can actually run I'm going really quick, but there's so much to talk about. You can really run high pressure in the actual air spring, if you will, of the vehicle where, uh, sorry, you can run low pressure with high volume in the air uh, spring in the vehicle, which means you can have a really nice, comfortable ride, but then also a lot of road holding and a lot of weight holding capacity. Of course, as you go up in height, I imagine the suspension comfort above medium degrades also like I imagine it does when you go below medium. These are all the things we'll talk about when we drive it, but I can't wait to see what's the recommended drive modes. And I'm gonna give you my recommended settings for driving around the city, driving on the highway, ripping on canyons, and of course, we're going to be shredding this thing on some great roads here in the hill country. 
can't wait to see how it performs. Uh, but just that suspension system speed was pretty amazing. Um, okay, the only thing I want to mention is I'm a little bit cautious of the front upper control arms on this particular one, uh, on all Cybertrucks. It's just a, a really thin piece of metal up there. It's been talked about quite a bit. I was looking at them today versus the Hummer EV and some other things, and I don't know. We'll take it off-road. We'll see how well they hold up. It's not necessarily a major issue. Yet, we'll see how they hold up over time. Tesla and front upper control arms have never been great. Model 3s are known for launching them left and right. It's just a known fault of that one. I would have thought they would have overbuilt it on the Cybertruck. Maybe it's not needed. Again, I'm not a suspension engineer. I can only drive the truck and see what happens. And uh, I do know a lot of suspension engineers that tell me this is really crazy and stupid. I'm just not sure if they're like against Tesla or against the Cybertruck and they just say everything is stupid or if it's actually stupid. So I want to you know, let's take everything that someone says with this truck, including me, with a grain of salt. Let's all figure it out together. And I want you guys to make up your own opinions. Um, wow, there's, you know, I could spend 10 hours talking about this truck. Just this windshield is insane. It comes so far in front of the driver and Colton's gonna do a whole detailing thing about it, but it is um, sort of hail resistant. It's not bulletproof, but it, you can really apparently throw some crazy stuff at this one, which is wild. It has the hardware four cameras and I'll show you everything they can see in it as well. Yeah, the, the windshield's crazy. The roof is crazy. The design is crazy. The aura of the truck is crazy. And, and I mean that in a truly great way. I've never been more excited and honestly more nervous to review a vehicle and to do testing on a vehicle than the Cybertruck because I think it's so important that we get this right. I don't want to show the truck in a negative way. I don't want to show the truck in a positive way, you know, unless it is truly positive or unless it is truly negative. I just want to show you what the truck is. And I feel like there's so much hype and so much emotion and so many stockholders fighting about this thing online that I'm like, no, just stop. Let's just evaluate each component individually. And um, I think with that, let's jump in the vehicle. By the way, uh, I, again, I haven't driven it yet, but just sitting here in the parking lot listening to the sound system, holy smokes. 15 speaker sound system, two individual subwoofers that just rip. It was crazy, really good sound system. I always say that our Audi e-tron with the super mega upgraded Bauer, or Bang & Olufsen in that one, the BMW iX with the Bang and, well, what does the iX have? Bowers & Wilkins, our Audi has Bang & Olufsen. Those are both amazing. The Bentley name system is amazing. Some Acuras have some really good systems. This is up there with the best of the best. I don't know unless I do a side-by-side -side comparison if this is truly the best sound system I've ever heard, but this is one of those vehicles that you spend $100,000 on a sound system and then it also comes with the truck. It's really good in there. The sound sage, the clarity, the separation. It's whoever is doing the Tesla audio system, props to you guys because this thing doesn't have to have a good sound system and it absolutely sets the benchmark in a truck absolutely sets the benchmark. And before that, actually my Rivian's Meridian system is an amazing system, great system. This just blows it out of the freaking water. I, I'm, I can't ever review a sound system for you guys or have you experience it because it would just sound like your MacBook speakers or whatever you're watching this on, but really amazing sound quality in this one. I can't stress that enough. I could just sit here and listen to music all day. And that's what I love about a vehicle, especially one that's as comfortable and well-sealed and as quiet on the highway as this one. With that banging sound system, you can just cruise. Okay, I'm gonna have you guys hop in the back here because I wanna go through some software stuff. I feel like a lot of Tesla people love their Tesla, including me, for the integration of software and hardware. And it all starts with that 18 and a half inch screen that's right in front of you. Now you will also notice that the Cybertruck is at 13% state of charge. And I'm sure you can imagine why. It's because I will be doing a lot of charging tests. And most of the charging on a road trip is important at very low states of charge. Before we get into the screen, I want to also just mention to you this seat. Uh, we have spent five hours driving this truck today. Again, Francie's been driving. I've been in the passenger seat. Ben's been driving a bit. Um, this seat rocks. It is a great seat. It's not a massaging seat. It is heated. It is cooled. The heating is good. It doesn't like burn you. It's not like Volkswagen seats. Those get really hot. I love Volkswagen heated seats and cooled seats. They're not quite at that level. Uh, but the shape of the seat, the comfort of the seat, 
really, really good. No complaints. I really actually like, I don't know if you can see this over here, Francie, but this jut out of the seat for me fits perfectly in sort of my neck cutout. So I just fit so nicely. The material is nice. It feels a little bit thicker, a little bit stronger than the Model S material. A little bit firmer padding than what's in the Model S and X. Nice stitching. It's not all perfect. You can see the seat here touches the center console. And occasionally when I would move around in the seat or hit a bump, it would rat or uh, start sort of squeak here. I wish they put a little bit of felt on the side of the seat. Just little optimizations that like, you know, a typical German company that obsesses over NVH and all these little areas would take care of. Okay, it's a Tesla. We knew there were going to be some squeaks and stuff, but but other than that, the only other rattle that in this entire truck is the back seat bench, uh, especially when someone's in the middle seat and pushes back. I don't know if you can do that, Francie. Yeah, let's do it. I can just give you the <laughs> the impression of what. Can you hear that? Yeah. So that's just on this particular one. Um, but we have to mention it because this car does have a, a you know, it's a factory delivered car with a, with a squeaky back seat. Uh, but other than those two things, the truck is solid. There's no creakiness when going over bumps or undulations or pulling into one of those parking lots where you almost, you know, feel like you're going to lift a wheel, but you don't. And partially that's because this has such insane body stiffness. Uh, just listening to Lars, one of the lead engineers of this truck, explain it to Jay Leno and others that he was on camera with. Um, wow. It just seems like the truck is, is, is stiffer than a sports car. And so I can't wait to stiffer than a McLaren P1, not just a sports car. One of the, uh, or was it a McLaren F1? I think he said P1. It was stiffer than crazy. Can't wait to test this out and try it out and experience everything. Okay. Should also mention the range. We haven't talked about that. The range is stated at 340 miles on the Cybertruck dual motor. This truck will not do 340 miles on a charge in any reasonable um, driving cycle. You might be able to do it if you drive 30 miles an hour all day. Uh, and the reason is a couple things. Of course, Tesla always maximizes the EPA number to get the biggest number to display. Uh, but also because this one's on the 20 inch all terrains and the all terrains do zap a little bit of juice, but you have to imagine the compromise of being able to be off roady and also sticky enough to put down the zero to 60 numbers and to give you the handling response that you want and look big and chunky. It's not always a great combination for range. So there will be, I imagine sometime later this year coming a cyber truck on the all season tires, the sort of road wheels and tires, and that should get significantly better range. One thing we've seen from testing Rivians is the all terrains zap a lot of juice out of the vehicle, but it's only sold with these tires. And I always try and review t vehicles on OE tires as much as possible. So our range calculations will be on these when the cyber truck comes out with the all seasons. Of course, I'll be doing a range test on that at the time. Let's kick on the climate control, really simple. And here we get into the big screen. Again, over 18 inches of screen real estate here. Absolutely beautiful. And uh, here, let's just turn the, the uh, vehicle on really quick, put it into low fan. What's cool is this is sort of the home screen of the Cybertruck and you have these cards that come up and that you can swipe left and right on. And actually when you have the truck in full screen, you can put them away or pull them up by clicking right here, which is really great. At least when the truck is in park, you can go full screen on this absolutely high resolution, high refresh rate, um, sort of 3D model of the Cybertruck. And what's cool is it accurately renders everything that's going on. You can see the rear wheel steering adjusting as I turn the steer by wire steering wheel, which feels really interesting. I can't wait to give you all the videos on this particular one. The brake lights will go as I hit the brakes. And just to show you the brake lights, this is, we don't even need to be on the outside of the car. This is your normal running light on the Cybertruck. As you hit the brake, you can see there's no chimsel or center mounted brake light up here. When you hit the brakes, that rear light bar turns into your chimsel and then you come off the brakes and it goes back to a normal brake light. This is all for FMVSS compliance, but I think that's actually a cool integration, a cool solution. And it's a big change on the back of the car that should draw the attention of a maybe texting driver behind you or someone that's just cruising, miss, uh, not paying attention, I should say. And that might that light change might really be like, whoa, what's going on? Also, you have the turn signals that light up right here. You can see in the back left and of course on the back right. And I'll be discussing those in detail. Of course, up front, the headlights are not what the truck uh, shows here. The headlights are actually in the bumper. So the headlights are these units down here. And then of course you have your turn signals that don't show up front. Do they? Oh yeah, they do. 
that bottom bit turns. And then if you hit your right turn signal, there you go. This is just such a cool display. I love it. It's a great way to show what's going on with the truck. Does it actually model the wiper? Let's take a look. Nope, the wiper is not visually represented here. And you turn the steering wheel and the wheels turn, but that doesn't actually happen when you're still. Uh, it's only when the vehicle is off, the steering wheel is essentially disconnected from the motors. So you can turn the wheel with the with the Cybertruck off. Let's show everyone that, should we? Yeah. Why don't you pop outside so you can get a side view of this. I'll try and shut the uh, Cybertruck off by getting out of it. So it should be off right now. Let's take a look. Yeah, now it's completely off. I'm not gonna hit the brake pedal to energize anything. So here we are turning it on. Let's take a look here really quick. Come on, microphone, let's go. And you can see uh, it's, there's a lot of force on the wheel, but I can turn the wheel left and right and the wheels aren't turning. How crazy is that? Now there's a ton of force in the steering wheel. Um, not a bunch, but definitely feels more than like a typical PlayStation game controller by about 50%. You can see it wants to return to center. But if I have the wheel turned all the way and I turn the Cybertruck on, watch this. Oh, the phone isn't in the car. Oh no. <laughs> Let's see how close we can get it. I'm going to keep the wheel turned and if you could just hold it right inside the window. So hopefully we can see the front wheels go. There we go. And then you can see, boom, now the steering wheel turns the wheels. So cool. Now I don't want to just dry steer Ben's truck all day long and wear out the motors, but I do want to dig into it. Now the steering has become really light and the wheels do turn and the whole truck shakes when you turn it because you're turning these massive 35 inch tires around. And uh, the, the way that this steering works, which is really wild, is there's no mechanical connection between this steering wheel and the front wheels like I showed you. And like I can show you again, you can literally just yank on it and the front wheels don't do anything. Again, it's the craziest freaking thing on the planet. And um, it's actually the first series production car to have steer by wire without a mechanical backup. There were some other cars that had steer by wire. It's not a new technology. Every, a lot of things are by wire, um, but there is no mechanical backup. Does that scare you? I don't know. To me, didn't even really think about it while we were cruising around in the Cybertruck today until I realized, oh yeah, steer by wire, there's nothing connecting the wheel. But then you think most cars that I drive today are steer, are brake by wire or accelerator pedal by wire. And I'm like, ah, whatever, leave that up to your own imagination. I'm not here to convince you that this is better or for your case, but I think it's a really interesting topic and I can't wait to experience it and drive it. There are two electric motors that are redundant on the front axle here. Uh, it's done by a supplier, I think Bosch, led by Tesla Engineering is my understanding. Um, I'm throwing Bosch out there because I think they were working on something like this, but I, I don't know that to be 100% true. I, I think it's just likely. But um, essentially you have a normal steering rack. There's nothing unusual about the rack down there other than there's no column. So you have redundant signals that come from the uh, steering wheel to the electric motors that force the front axle uh, to, to turn left and right. If one motor fails, you have another motor that can do both. And then you have a rear motor that can, that can turn the rear axle. Again, currently only about three degrees. Maybe Tesla said 10 degrees coming in a software update. But again, we can only review the truck as it is today, and it is an early one. So the steering system just seems incredible. Back in the truck we go so that we can get into more software stuff. By the way, to open the doors, these little squares on the side, you push it in, and then there's a plunger that pushes the door out. And before we actually open it up, maybe quickly I can just show you guys, where's the plunger on this one? Right here. So if I open the, I'm gonna close the door, I'm gonna open it, and you can see, if you can look in, I can't actually close the door anymore. You can see I'm banging on this thing, right? And that's because the plunger is out. So I can put my fingers here and uh, won't chop my fingers off. That was scary. I was hoping that the plunger didn't go back in, but because this is actually quite sharp on the side uh, and that, that would kind of hurt. Uh, but as soon as I open the door, plunger goes back in. Did you catch that on camera? Okay, let's do that one more time. I'm going to have you uh, kind of get the camera set down here so I can show everyone the plunger. This is not unusual for Tesla. A lot of Teslers, te Teslers, a lot of Teslers have had these icebreaker things. All right, so I'm going to open the door. There we go. Plunger pushes it. Boom. There it is sliding back in. So that's what's doing the magic of forcing the door open. The front doors work the same way. It's those little buttons on the B pillar and they are physical buttons, um, which I think is kind of a nice touch. Back in the Cybertruck, really easy to get in and out of. The highest point here is just about where my head slides in, so I never hit my head getting in and out of it, which is 
Again, kind of nice. Ooh, not a good door thunk on that one. It's always had a good door thunk. Maybe because the window is down? Had it rattled in there? I don't know. Let's try it again. Yeah. Huh. That didn't sound that good, did it? It's double pane glass. Not as thick as some other cars, but man, do they did a good job of sealing this thing up. Uh, it is 12.08 a.m. <laughs> this video is only going up in seven hours from now, roughly. So we better hurry up because I think I could talk for seven hours. Oh my goodness. We better hurry up, but there's so much to talk. Uh, more Cybertruck stuff on the screen. So you can obviously open your front trunk. You can, uh, I don't even know what this button would do. You can adjust your suspension height, low entry, low, medium, high. And then of course, extract in off-road mode. You can open and close your tonneau cover. From here, you can open your tailgate, but if you hit that, you can't close your tailgate. Uh, the only warning right now is sentry mode is unavailable because we're at 13% state of charge, which indicates 41 miles of indicated range. So this is just like a home screen. You can obviously put some navigation in. There's a bunch of apps, but when you put the vehicle into drive, instantly the map comes on over. And what you can do is you don't necessarily need to be in drive for the map to come over. You can just pull it from the right side. And when you're in here, it's just like any other Tesla at this point, which I think most of our viewers are familiar with. You have superchargers absolutely everywhere. You can just go just about wherever you want to go. We're upside down at the moment, but look at this. You just go, all of these are high power DC fast charging stations from Tesla up here where we live in Colorado. Crazy. Oh no. What's going on with Estes park temporary closure. What? I've never seen that site down. Oh no, that's our local one. Anyway, all these other ones looking great. We all know Tesla has great charging infrastructure. It's not perfect, as I just showed you. I'm not here to make Tesla look perfect, but uh, man, they, they really just know how to do charging better than, than pretty much anyone. So within the map, maps, it maps it'll do um, route planning. Let's just put in where Fancy is from. Let's go to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, from here in Austin, Texas. Memphis, Texas. That's Memphis, Texas. Let's not go there. Let's go to Memphis, Tennessee. Do, 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 Tennessee. Sorry about that. And you can see instant route planning with everything right there. Preconditioning has already started. I can hear the heat pump working along with, I assume, the electric motors. It's going to get us to Georgetown at 4%, which looks awesome. And then this is the one thing that is quite concerning. 50-minute charge, 55-minute charge, 40-minute charge. This is not looking class leading. This is not looking very good at all. Let's just get this focused over here. Sorry about that, viewers. But uh, yeah, don't know what's going on with that. This is the one thing we really need to test because if there's any one major downside of the Cybertruck that I can tell at this moment in time, it is the charging performance is my guess. I don't know. And I really wish it wasn't because I love a fast charging EV. Uh, you do have your volume controls down here that you can pull up your equalizer. Of course, I have it set the way that I like it, typically in a V shape, a little bit maybe rear of center, but these are all things that you can adjust. Plenty of radio streaming options. I'm personally a Spotify heavy user, so I pretty much only use Spotify in the cars, and that's about it. Of course, you can have Bluetooth audio and all of these things. So there's your maps. Um, by the way, phone is a key. Your cell phone is the key for the Cybertruck. There's a backup key card, um, but the cell phone, phone is a key, works great. And uh, that's what I'm using here. There's also a fantastic app that comes with the Cybertruck. And we'll show you that maybe in the Everything We Know video, just because we're filming on the phone that has the app. But it's the same as the other Tesla app. The same things you can do with it, you can do here. Interestingly, this truck does not have autopilot. What's up with that? Brand new Tesla. Tesla's known for autopilot. Driver assistance, full self-driving by yesterday or by, you know, three years ago, whatever it was supposed to be. This thing doesn't even have autopilot. It has traffic aware cruise control, adaptive cruise, and it actually does traffic light stop sign control. So it will stop at the lights and everything with uh, it. But this vehicle is optioned with the full FSD and it's actually on FSD version 12 or version 12 software, but it doesn't have autopilot. It just seems weird. I mean, I know it's maybe a low priority, but I feel like the people that are forking out a lot of money for an electric truck they've waited years for should get a finished product. Sorry to be that guy. That bothers me. That's annoying. Okay, so much more we can do here as soon as I hit the control screen, which is the car in the bottom left-hand corner. Of course, to put it in forward and reverse, it works automatically if your seatbelt's on or you can slide this up 
or slide that rear for reverse. You have a front camera on this particular one that can also be washed, which is really nice. You have your side cameras and your rear camera. When you don't have any cameras up, you can optionally have your rear view because again, the tonneau cover blocks it. And even when the tonneau is uh, closed, man, it's just not a good view out the back. You can put your rear view up there or over here, I haven't driven it yet. I haven't decided where I like it. At least here, it's a little bit more out of the way, not really bothering anyone. And I think that's pretty good. Ah, the Kia Soul has decided to join the chat over here. Okay, very interesting. Let's put this back into park. Um, now you have sort of a limited view of the other menu that we had before over here on this side. Inside the controls menu, you can adjust your mirroring, mirrors, you can adjust your steering, which actually in this truck doesn't work we've found the steering column does not adjust at all. Nothing we can do to get this thing to adjust. It's supposed to use this scroll wheel, just like every other Tesla. It doesn't work. Not sure what's up with it. Not good. Uh, but the mirror adjustment does work. So we can use the adjustments to adjust these rather large mirrors that are triangular in shape, just matching with the cyber truck. You can see I'm moving it over there and it's going up and down, no problems at all. You also have mirror auto tilt, auto dim, auto fold, and heated mirrors. I can click the HVAC here and turn on the heated mirrors on this. So if you have ice on the side of the truck, you're good. You also, of course, have two levels of heated yoke, a heated windshield wiper section, I think is this button right here. It's not a heated windshield, but it's just a placeholder for where the windshield wiper sits to melt the ice off underneath. And of course, a defogging and a defrosting function for your front glass, which is a really thick piece of glass. So you need a lot of heat and a lot of defrosting power up there. Okay. We know we're moving all over the place. We have a car wash mode that will, um, let's see, do, 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 do. Yeah. Just normal. Same as the other cars lets you go into neutral, which is cool. There's also a neutral um, on the shifter, if you want to, you know, just coast down the highway, fold your mirrors. This is where you adjust your ride height, tonneau. There's a lot of multiple places to do a lot of things. Window locks, screen brightnesses. There's a glove box. We can hit tap to open. It sort of folds out like a tray. That's over-engineered. That's stupid. What do you think, Francie? Mm. How, it seems like it's changing speed and kind of getting caught up. Yeah, it's like, uh, uh. And then, <laughs> I don't know. It already worked before. Okay. It's just like, you're going to get jammed in the knee when you open that thing. Whatever. Not the end of the, if that's what we're complaining about, we're, I think Tesla's doing just fine here. So no issues on that one. So that's your main controls. Once you go past your main controls, you have your, your dynamics. Now, this is what I'm really going to dig into in the driving review of the truck. I also love how you can separate some of the modes out. I'm gonna explain all of this in the driving review. There's also an off-road function that will give you two different base settings for off-road height or for off-road modes. You have different terrain that you can go on. You can actually adjust your handling balance a little bit like track mode. So this is how I would drive it all the time full drifting. I can actually hear the, um, oh, this is really cool. I can hear the, uh, the motor, the cooling of the, um, battery pack and motors going. And you also get some vitals button over here. I'm just noticing where it gives you your battery pack, average temperature, your front and rear motor temperature and your ride height at the given time. How cool is that? And of course I would want minimum stability, rock and roll. Wade mode is super cool. You can see we're raising up massively. It's going up Whoa. So this thing must be going to the moon right now. It's so smooth. You don't really even notice. Um, Wade mode pressurizes the battery pack. And I think when we do the everything you want to know about Cybertruck or answering your questions, I want to know what noise that makes and how that all works. And I'd like to drive it through water. Essentially, this pressurizes the, bat the high voltage battery pack so you can wade through water without any of the, um, you know, sort of uh, pressure relief valves if there's a thermal event giving way or having any major issue. And that's such a cool feature. And when I saw that, I'm like, damn, that's awesome because now you're utilizing existing air compressors on the vehicle, which is for the suspension to pressurize the high voltage battery. It just needs a little bit of air. There's an extra, I think, snorkel valve or snorkel is what they call it. Something like that just seems so smart, so cool. This is why Tesla freaking blows away anyone. No, you're never going to find like a Mercedes 
putting a Wade mode in their car. You got to love it. And like who, you know, like someone definitely is going to drive this thing through the ocean for a YouTube video. It wouldn't be me, but you know, someone drove a plaid underwater, I think for a video, you get stupid people and it's kind of fun, whatever. Let's have some fun. Just try not to hurt anyone in the process. Uh, towing and hauling really important to me. There's a trailer mode as well, which when I pull up trailer brake with scroll wheel, this is great. So I can hold the right scroll wheel to engage the brakes. I really love this feature from my Rivian actually. I have a trailer brake boost. I'm not actually sure what this does. Um, quickly engage more trailer braking power. After the boost, trailer braking power then gradually increases to the maximum set in trailer brake gain. Ah, interesting. So this is like maybe you set your brake gain normally, but then as you hit the brake pedal, boom, you're good to go. There's also a trailer light test function. I think that's really cool. We'll be trying that. There's adaptive regenerative braking. We'll be talking about that when we're towing. I think that adds even more regen to add to a consistent experience, which is really cool. But I really love this right scroll wheel with a trailer brake. It's like if you're in an emergency situation, you just need to hit the brakes and boom, you're good to go. So I really, really love that. Um, so let's take it out of trailer mode. We don't need it anymore. Charging. Again, it's always best to leave your cars at the lowest state of charge for the longest period of time needed. I charge my cars to 50% every day because I'm a nerd. Most of you will probably charge to 80% every day. And that's the Tesla maximum recommended for the daily charge. There's a trip portion where if you need it, you can charge to 90 or hundred percent. Most every electric car works this way, except for the lithium iron phosphate battery packs that just have great longevity. You really can't hurt them and they actually need to be full charged to calibrate. This is NMC chemistry. So pretty much, you know, the lower, the better 30% is probably the healthiest for long-term storage. Uh, but 50% plugged in is probably the most practical for you. You can also set your, um, here, let's go back here to charging. You can set your, uh, you know, start charging or your departure time. As an example, you can schedule it. So it preconditions on the time, all of this is normal Tesla stuff. We won't dig too much into it. I do love how they give you supercharging tips, which is navigate to the charger. So it can precondition arrive with low state of charge, leave space between cars only matters on version two superchargers. The rest will do site level power sharing at the, at the entire site. And then uh, of course, don't leave your car after it's done charging or in this case truck. Outlets, you have a power feed in the front, which is a 48 volt, I believe, could be a 12 volt as well. Someone should confirm this. I'd like to actually get a multimeter on it and see what it does. But both in the roof and the front trunk, um, there are uh, extra accessory wires where you can mount light bars or winches or some other things perhaps could be kind of interesting. And then there's the outlets because we're at too low state of charge. If you're below 20%, the outlets don't work. For me, I would say that's kind of annoying. I like to run my truck to dead or my cars to dead because I want to use the battery. I paid for the battery. Let me use it. Give me just like a, I'm a dumb person who doesn't mind running out of charge, override this function. And then you can enable your cabin outlets on. And then um, if you get out of the vehicle and you just want to have things charge, you can hit this keep uh, outlets on for 12 hours after you exit the vehicle. To the autopilot settings, you can see there's no autopilot. I already mentioned just traffic aware cruise control. You can actually use the right scroll wheel, unlike Model S and X, to adjust your follow distance, very similar to 3 and Y. And um, there are only six different adjustments. There's a not, not a one. Once they got rid of the radar, they got rid of the one. So you can't go full Audi on the car in front of you. But even sometimes they still follow too close. I usually keep it on two, but sometimes I go more. I really love how you can just hit the scroll wheel and the steering wheel and adjust the following gap. Really great. You can see FSD beta will come in an upcoming software release. It doesn't tell you when or how long or anything like that. And that's, this is just typical Tesla. This is the stuff that drives me nuts. It drives so many people that root for the company and really hope that they do well, that they deliver a finished product on day one, like every other car company. And they just don't and, or at least haven't. So at least here uh, with one of the most important features of a vehicle, which is auto steer, uh, especially if you're taking long trips. So I really hope, I don't care if they get FSD beta for me personally out right away, but at least give me basic autopilot Tesla. This is what you're known for. Uh, and then of course, all the standard, you know, adjust to the speed limits, forward collision warning, obstacle wear, acceleration, green light, traffic chime, that is all in there as well. Yeah, what else is there? Walk away door lock at home, things like this. MyQ connected garage you can have as well, which is kind of cool. So this all works uh, really nicely. And uh, th this is all the same as normal Tesla. No fog lights on this particular one, just off parking on an auto. 
Auto turn signals are pretty cool, which is when you turn into the lane, they will actually auto turn off. Speaking of the turn signals here on the Squirkle, they are a physical button press that has such a nice tactile feel. Very, actually even more tactile than the Model 3 Highland, which I've been lucky enough to drive. There's a full review on this channel of that particular one. A few videos, we took it around the Nürburgring, we did a whole bunch of crazy stuff with that one. That was fun. We have uh, auto high beam, headlight after exit, bed light brightness, max baby, but there's an auto as well. And just like Model 3 Highland, you can enjoy, of course, adjust your interior ambient lighting to whatever color you see fit. If you want green, yellow, blue, and anything in between, you can of course do all of that. Um, nice. And there's of course footwell lights, which are just sort of bright. Speaking of the footwell, by the way, I am just gonna quickly turn on the uh, dome lights here. If you can take a look by my feet, I don't know if you can see that very well, Francie, but the brake pedal is pretty firm and I think it is a, um, it doesn't feel like a very brake by wire system. Perhaps it does. I need to play around with it to see if it adds more regen, but I think this might actually be a physically connected brake pedal. But this is the first Tesla that I ever have a bottom hinged accelerator pedal. Uh, maybe the Roadster did, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've driven it, but most Teslas have a top hinged pedal and this is a bottom hinged pedal. Does, do you have a preference? I don't know. I prefer a bottom hinge pedal personally, so I'm pretty happy with this. I think that's great. Uh, rather than a top hinge one, it means your foot isn't gonna slip off. They're spaced nicely if you're wearing boots that you're not gonna do a pedal misapplication uh, is my feeling. And so I really actually prefer this easier to get a little bit better modulation with different shoe types with a bottom hinge, especially one as fat as this. And it's quite a firm pedal, which is pretty nice. More display settings. You can of course change it into a bright daytime setting like this, boom, or automatic mode where it goes dark. By the way, the response on this system is class leading, really amazing. Um, yeah, I do like the Cybertruck logo when it comes on. I keep the rear view camera on, which is this one when we're in drive, as an example. I keep this one on all the time, but you don't have to have that. And I believe this is actually removable, the rear view uh, mirror here, because I've seen some of them with this and some without. I don't want to break the truck, but I think this is removable, which is kind of neat. While we're on the topic up here of the rear view mirror, the hazard lights is the only light up here in the roof. And you don't have to like, if you're in an emergency situation, you don't have to get right on the hazard light. You can just bam, hit the roof and you're good to go. And then you can just swipe up and you're good there as well. So that's kind of cool. In an emergency, boom, just smack the roof and the hazards come on and you can smack it. You don't have to look for the individual one, which is really great. As a backup, you also have park reverse neutral and drive. Um, which is really kind of nice. This is more for like car washes or if the screen fails or if there's a software glitch, uh, this doesn't stay on all the time. I guess I assume you could just use it all the time. You, it just is sort of a, um, you just, it feels your hand and it wakes up the controls. Very similar to Model S and X. It's just up here. Model 3 Highland is up here as well, uh, rather than in the screen. For the most part, most people will just have their seatbelt on like this, put their car, uh, put their foot on the brake. I may not have auto, uh, uh, auto shift enabled, and then it would just go and drive and go. But uh, you know, you have overrides, but I just really like the idea that you don't need to like feel around for this button. If you're in an emergency, wham, smack the roof, and then your hazards are on. So that's, that's really, a, I think a well thought out feature. Really, really nice there. Um, okay, that was display where we in, trips. That's what we like to see. We have everything we want, current drive, since last charge, and two trips. I typically live trip B as uh, my entire life cycle, but since last charge is an amazing function. No other automaker really gets this one right. Tesla knows what we want, and that's what we want. What you see right here, all is good. 750 miles on the odometer on this particular one. Navigation, we're not gonna dig into too much. It's all the same as the normal cars. Um, one cool thing with the Cybertruck and every Tesla, of course, is sentry mode. It will actually allow you to log in through your phone and view the cameras live all around the vehicle. It will record if you have an accident on a hard drive or if someone you know, decides they hate your Cybertruck and spray paints, oh, this is stupid or whatever it is, it will catch all of that, which is really great. And uh, automatic dash cam built in using the uh, mini camera system on this particular one. So smart, so well integrated. Uh, it does use some power sentry mode, but it's well worth it. If someone damages your vehicle, uh, you're good to go. I've, I've famously had my Model S backed into uh, with sentry mode off because I didn't like the phantom drain. And now I, I tend to use it a bit more <laughs> because it would have been great to, to find that person. Uh, 
So yeah, blind spot warning, which is nice. There's also a blind spot warning light built into the mirror cover here, similar to Model 3 Highland. We'll talk about it as we drive, but there's just a little red light in here. I would have preferred that it was like a typical orange one built into the side view mirror, like most vehicles have blind spot, but okay, we'll take it. We'll take anything so we don't have to take our eyes away from the direction we're looking. There's a pin to drive function, which is great, which is you know, if you're worried someone may steal your car or have access to it, break into your house, grab the key card and go. Uh, you can have a code and actually the code moves around on the screen so they can't see the fingerprints as to where you touch every time. Really, really smart stuff. Um, there's a speed limit mode. There's a, a Joe mode, which actually reduces the, the loudness of the chimes so that you don't wake your kids up because Joe's kids were getting woken up by the Tesla. I, I just love how they take customer feedback and implement uh, functions and things like this. Tesla is just better than anyone at it. 50 PSI is the recommended tire pressure, which Tesla always goes quite high. Rivian is 48 PSI on there. All terrains, two PSI more here means probably a little bit less grip off-road. Of course, you would want to air down for off-road. There is no built-in uh, high-pressure um, uh, tire filler uh, air compressor on this particular vehicle. You just have to bring a mobile one and you can get an accessory, of course. This one's slightly low. We'll have to adjust the tire pressures uh, before we do any of our efficiency testing, of course. All of this stuff is pretty normal. I do. I did promise that I would show you the camera preview to show you what all the cameras can see on the Cybertruck. So here you can see the inside of the truck. Hello, viewers. <laughs> and then here we can see outside the vehicle, you have your main camera view. You have your wide camera view. This is all hardware for stuff. You can do this in every Tesla, actually. You have your left door pillar, your left fender, your right door pillar, your right fender. What is that screen that pops up as we go through? It's pretty funny. You have your rear view and then your front camera that's built into the bumper down below. The front camera is really nice, actually, because if you're cruising around and you uh, hit the camera button, which there's a physical camera button on the steering wheel now that I can click and bring up, um, it will actually give you the lines as to where you're going here, which is really great. And I think I already showed you, you can wash it, which is obviously pretty freaking sweet. Um, we should just mention some of the other apps. This is all very similar to every Tesla, so I'm not going to dig into it. I can control the rear screen from the front. So this is what Francie has access to, to adjust the air vents around, to adjust three levels of fan that also adjust the entire car, to adjust rear or low uh, fan output, which is great. She can also adjust the seats, move the passenger seat forward only while parked, while you're in motion. If someone's sitting there, you can't do that rear heated seats as well. The center rear heated seat, uh, or the center seat is not heated, unlike my Model 3, which is actually, how does my Model 3 have a rear heated middle seat and this one doesn't? I don't know. Um, the Model 3 Highland didn't either. You can adjust some of the audio back there and of course watch YouTube, Netflix, or whatever sort of streaming service you want, except Disney Plus. They got rid of that for some reason. Uh, I'm not going to get into why or anything. I really don't know the exact reason. We can all speculate, of course. So I think that's kind of a shame for the customers. Uh, you have an energy menu, which just got updated to the Cybertruck. So you can see where it shows your projected uh, state of charge arrival to the Georgetown supercharger. And I use this quite a bit, especially while I was towing a thousand miles down here in the Model X. This was a really great screen to have. You can compare it against rated uh, range versus your projected uh, from the trip planner built in. Tesla does this almost better than anyone, just nailing it almost every time. Recently, though, I have seen some bugs and I hope they work out some of the route planner bugs so you don't get left stranded. Always do a, a mental check on everything. Of course, you have dash cam built in, phone calls for Bluetooth, uh, it'll read messages. I love the built-in Spotify. And uh, of course you have an, a toy box where you can play games in here. And I highly recommend that you take a look at my friend Brandon Tesla Flex's information um, because he will be showing a lot of the games, a lot of the different things in here software wise that I may not uh, have the effort to dig into. Um, enough on software, Francie? Sure. Should we just, can we just go into service mode very quickly? Well, now you join us inside the service menu and um, basically I, I've done plenty of videos on how to actually get into this menu. You just click the car in the bottom left, you go to uh, software, you hold on the model of the vehicle and then a menu bar pops up. You type in service and then boom, you're in here and there's a bunch that you can look at. So here's all the cameras. You can see your connectivity for your connection of everything, which is great. You have your software in this case. 
which you know your autopilot software somehow 1.6 gigabytes just for um just for traffic or cruise control i guess okay ecu update status you can see everything is green looking nice and updated uh succeeded tesla does software just amazing really really good stuff here we have some charging data of course one thing that's interesting is they don't necessarily show us uh, the voltage of the battery pack at any given time and I really wish they would because I'd like to know when what the voltage is in high voltage or when it switches to uh, from series to parallel this is where you can see that switch happen when you plug it into a supercharger this series goes to parallel you hear a chunk and then you can charge natively on uh, 400 volt or 500 volt charging infrastructure at higher current through here course you have your temperature pins that are monitoring your temperature on the inlet port uh, in this case ac and dc pins are shared so these will always match on european ccs vehicles which i'm not sure if there are any plans for cybertruck to be ccs um, those of course will be separated we have a high voltage system we're at 12.2 percent state of charge interesting you'll notice there's no health test on this particular one if we go into high voltage battery it says it's okay to uh air ship it because we're below a certain state of charge to re uh, basically increase our isolation of the battery pack and of course uh you know we can we can ground ship it but we're at uh, again 12 percent state of charge and that's what all of this is indicating this is really interesting now we're getting into the 48 volt sub architecture of the vehicle not every component on the vehicle is 48 volts but this is one of those big step changes of the Cybertruck is having a higher low voltage system, if you will. It reduces the current loads, reduces the losses, reduces the weight. And I do think we see a lot of that actually as the end user, as the end customer. Ultimately, does is this more of an engineering decision or an engineering uh, interest uh, interesting thing rather than an actual benefit to the end user? Perhaps yes, but I think it's actually very cool. So you can see that you have your DC to DC converter here which is really interesting and this is what's going from i believe um yeah your battery pack your high voltage battery pack to your 48 volt system so this is what's basically going back and forth between the battery and your uh your mid voltage i guess mv is what they technically they don't call it low voltage and you can see that's at 46.8 volts at 100 percent. so it's not quite a 48 volt system but it's 47 volt system nears makes no difference and that seems to work pretty well and this is really cool certain components of the vehicle still run on 12 volt and that would be more like um you would need a 12 volt dc to dc up to 48 volts uh, a booster if you will a converter and that uh, will be on each sub component is my understanding of how that's wired but of course if anyone at tesla wants to give us more information or we'll wait for the sandy monroe teardown videos and all of that i'm really looking forward to seeing how the low and mid voltage systems operate on this particular one my understanding by the way is um if you run out of charge in the cyber truck and you need to jump the low voltage system you can put 12 volt on the contact leads and it will boost that up to 48 volt to charge up the mid voltage battery which then will allow you to wake up the high voltage battery and plug in a charger that's just my understanding of uh, some of the interaction also there's no like cigarette lighters in here so if you need to run a radar detector or something i guess you'll have to power it off of USB-C. Okay, if we come over here to the thermal situation, this is very similar to the other cars. We can do an HVAC performance, which rips the heat pump full cold, full heat, just to test that it all works. I imagine that everything does here works here pretty well because it's been extremely comfortable. You have your um, your valve situation, so you can see what your chiller is doing. You can see your liquid cooled condenser over here. You can see your compressors running at uh, 900 RPM. I just love all of this. It's really great uh information to have here uh, certainly not as detailed you don't have the overall thermal map like you do in the other vehicles it's a very limited service mode compared to model 3 s x and y but still great information for the nerds to know what's going on but you can see the pressures here are all very similar given the conditions to the other cars which makes me think some of the valve systems some of the thermal systems are carryovers from the other vehicles but of course i could be wrong the suspension mode super cool here's where you can see jack mode on uh, normal air suspension mode we can deflate but then you need a manual pressure increase to pump the back up but this will just drop it on the uh drop it on the bump stops is my understanding you can see the pressure in each one of the the struts oh we could carolina squat this thing 
maybe when I get my Cybertruck, I don't want to mess Ben's truck up, but what I'd love to do is raise it all the way up and then deflate the right rear and left rear struts and just have it parked. <laughs> uh, just for a photo, that'd be so funny. This is so cool. And then inside you can see the windows are all pretty normal. Nothing here unusual. The doors, okay, calibrate presenter. That must be the, the plunger. And then you can... Um, yeah, configure VC doors. So that's must be the vehicle controller for the doors. And then there's a whole one for the tonneau where you have two motors, a rear controller and two latches uh, for it to come in. And then of course the tonneau control uh, switch. And if it loses calibration, you can always come in and calibrate. Again, this is not really for a user to use, but it is cool that Tesla lets you activate a lot of these ones, your airbag controls, and of course your seat controls. This is kind of interesting. Interior cabin radar. Did we know that the Cybertruck had an interior cabin radar? For? Um, occupant detection. They removed the radar from the front of it, but then they put radar on the inside of it. Uh, so that's cool. It doesn't know that you're back there though, Francie, does it? Normally they use seat sensors for this. Mm, I'm on the edge. That's interesting. So if I cover the camera, yeah, it's actually warm up here. If you look where my hands are pointing right up here by the uh, camera. It's quite warm up this way, which is not unusual when the camera's running pretty hard. But that is cool. This is the first time I've seen that before. Neato. What else we got in here? Let uh, Pre-tensioners, all normal stuff, occupancy sensors. Why would you need a radar if you have occupancy sensors? Don't know. But that's the end of service mode for you guys. So let me just exit it really quick. There's a couple last things I want to look for in the full tour. I'd like to show you more about the usability of the front seats, which really nice. I'm going to have you guys actually come around to this door. If you wouldn't mind popping out. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's all give Francie a big thank you for flying in and helping to film all these videos. <laughs> and we also have the rest of the team. Colton's coming down. Drew's on his way. Yeah, so if you just hang out there for a second, I just kind of want to show everyone with that view. Can you go wide view, perhaps? I'm not sure if that'll help at all. Um, let's just show everyone the, the cabin space. First of all, sitting in here, I can get nice and low in the Cybertruck, which for me is really important in a vehicle. I also have plenty of room to spread out. This is a wide, it's a big, expansive car. And it's just like the steering wheel, uh, I thought I was going to hate it. it. feels great in the hand right here. I love how you never have to go hand over hand. The ergonomics of everything, the screen to my back position is really nice. Interestingly, the screen doesn't seem to tilt like it does in my Model S. There's no tilt, but personally, I always keep it flat anyway, so I guess I'm not missing anything. And this is just really freaking awesome. There are two wireless phone chargers here, although I have noticed that it's already overheated my phone. Why they don't pipe the HVAC into here like Porsche does with their Cayenne and some other upcoming models, I don't know because that was one of the coolest things that I've ever seen and it makes for a more efficient charge and means your phone doesn't overheat and it only ducks the cooling uh, in here when your phone is on there. I don't know, Porsche nailed that one, I think. Cup holders seem great. We'll have to do the strawberry acai test. Uh, I haven't tested it yet. J1772 adapter is of course included with every Cybertruck. This is technically an 80 amp rated adapter, I think still, is it? Yeah, 80 amp maximum, but no Cybertruck has an 80 amp onboard charger. The uh, center console, super deep, very plasticky. This is where it kind of feels a little, I don't know, nasty, prototypey. And if you're gonna skimp on any materials, this is definitely the place to do it. But stuff just feels a little bit cheap in this whole center console area. This is probably the weakest part of the truck. It looks cool, it's the right size, it's just very not great materials. And again, that's just coming from my side. It's a truck, who cares? That's one viewpoint, but a lot of people will buy these as lifestyle vehicles, not intending to use them as a truck. Of course, if I get one, it's gonna be a work truck. We're gonna beat the crap out of it and that's how we will treat it. If I just come down here, there's actually a light that is lighting up this sort of underfloor storage area, very similar to the early Model S that had the uh, the flat floor. And I'm not sure if you can see any ports down there, Francie. Is there any, uh, where'd that light go that we just had? It's in your pocket. Let's kick that bad boy on. Any, uh, I'll pop out too. Let's see what we can find. Because I think there's supposed to be some outlets in here. So okay. yeah, here, I'll grab the light really quick if you don't mind, just so I can see. Yeah, nothing under here, just straight plastic seat control stuff, no 12 volt outlets. Under the screen, there's a little speaker or a little uh, fan, could be a fan for cooling it, perhaps. 
I'm not, oh yeah, there's actually an OBD port in this one right here by the brake pedal. That's cool. We got to uh, plug in my Autel scanner to that. Typically Tesla doesn't do any data on OBD and this whole vehicle runs on mostly high power or high speed ethernet rather than can, but there is a legal requirement, I guess, to put an OBD on there. So that's interesting. Um, okay, let's just take a look in the back seat since we got the light out. What else is there to show under here? Um, what the heck is this? We got two USB ports. Is this a 12 volt outlet? What? No way. Is it really? It's shaped like one. Come on. What? Oh, no. It's, on. <laughs> it's good. Got me. NEMA 515 outlet right here. Or sorry, 520 outlet. I don't know if you can pull full 20 amps from these ones, but it's worth a try. But that's just a little cover that goes right there. I thought somehow they did a like a cigarette lighter, uh, you know, regular 12 volt outlet and a little light under here. USB-C ports. Again, this all just feels scratchy and not final and just not nice materials throughout. Um, the screens are amazing. Some of these things they did so well, but yeah, the materials aren't nice. By the way, I haven't given a back seat review yet. And so I'm going to hop back here. I keep thinking of more things we have to do for the full tour. And people think we just do this for Cybertruck. We do this for every car. <laughs> this is like, I'm telling scary <laughs> stories. <laughs> telling scary score stories in the Cybertruck. Uh, how do I turn this? Well, I guess I'll just kind of I don't know what the heck to do with it. It's too fancy for my lifestyle. Here, you can you can hold it. If I close the rear door, dang, this thing is, uh, you know, get, gets the attention of everyone around. He's jamming out in his soul. <laughs> that guy's living the dream. What is it, 12.45 a.m.? Ripping music in the soul. Alcantara headliner up here, but I can, I have to say, if we just look up here to the glass roof, let me hold the camera. Oh boy. This is, uh, it really will come out during the day. Some of this build quality stuff up here, not looking good. I don't know what this vent is for, maybe a speaker. Uh, plenty of headroom in this one as well. So, um, oh, I can actually smell what that dude was doing. <laughs> um, the back seat angle is perfect. The seats are extremely comfortable. No headroom issues. I'm six foot one, by the way, huge leg room. I can pretty much put them all the way out. And the seat is on the bottom position. So there's some risers under there where I can really get my feet out the rear, um, um, whatever this thing is called. What do you Atlas holder. Atlas holder. Yeah. I don't know. I wish it extended to here rather than here. They're a little bit, a little bit small and actually like the materials just a little bit weak on the back of the seat it needs to be sculpted a little bit more. And, um, yeah, damn, this is cool. But this seat, do I have it just rip on it? No, it feels like it wants to come. What's getting, what's it getting held up on? Oh yeah. Maybe I have to pull this. No, I think, Oh yeah, you have to put it back and then pull it. Yeah, I think this is what's rattling. It like feels like it's not latched in there very well. So what happens when you pull it down? Yeah, then you get cup holders. And then can you go into the... No, you can't go into the bed on this one, but there is actually an isofix position for all three seats. So you can put three car seats across. Let us know if you want us to try that. Yeah. Uh, we should get some car. If anyone has a family in Austin, Texas with three car seats, shoot us a message immediately so we don't have to go and buy three car seats. <laughs> and then, you know, we, I guess we could just donate them after we buy them. That probably may not be a bad idea. That's nice. Okay. Let's do that. Um, yeah, really nice individual three seats on, on each one of these, which indicates, oh no, these two are connected on the bottom and this is an individual. There's something cool you can do in the back seat, by the way. I'm going to show you the, by the way, show the rear door pockets. If you don't mind, they're fairly deep. They have a little bit of rubberized floor on them and a drink holder as well. So that's pretty cool, but there is a way to lift up the seats from here uh, and maybe it's this. Oh no, this is a, oh yeah, there's a little string. I'll show everyone on the other side. This is so cool. This is one of the best features of the Cybertruck. And it's something my Rivian doesn't have. It's something a lot of pickup trucks do have. This is not a new truck feature. Oh, and the door opens 90 degrees. How nice is that? Because normally, I think my Rivian only opens to about here. And I'm always trying to get crap in there. That door does not open 90 degrees. I don't know if that's a, this particular one issue. We, maybe we should just really rip on it. <laughs> we can make any door open 90 degrees. <laughs> you got another car we could crash it. All right, take a look. This is a little pull tab. Can you see that, Francie? Yeah. Okay. 
If I pull the pull tab, boom, then this gets lifted up, locks in, and now we have room for dogs. And we have room for Francie's. Oh, man, that was cool. That was like a drone shot. <laughs> Jordan will love it. Ultimate quality on out of spec. Um, yeah, let's just show everyone that door over here on this side. This one, this is as far as it opens. It's like they put the wrong latch. They put a front door latch on the rear door. Well, we just had a major panic attack because our my phone died that we were filming on and we thought we lost the whole hour and a half long clip that you guys are probably asleep by now. If anyone's watching this video at this point, you're crazy, but there's so much to go into and there's a vehicle as radical as this that's new and on the market. And I truly have not covered everything, even things like the recovery hooks down here that you can just yank on. And we'll be doing that when we run the truck out of charge in a future video to test the capacity of the battery pack. The front camera with a washer jet, super cool that you can see that just to the left there. The front mounting plate stuff for a front license plate if you live in a state that requires it uh, would be interesting to explore as well things like what's below the rear the wheel covers we'll be covering in an upcoming episode on answering all of your questions and even answering some of mine and of course i want to talk about the mounting brackets for the roof hardware there's one two three four optional points to mount uh roof crossbars but you're on this like 45 degree upward slope the whole way so how does that work that's got to be awkward there's built-in power to that top right one even towing back here we haven't discussed much about what's under this ugly diaper looking thing i don't know it's just it's not a good looking rear bumper and it hangs so low there's so much empty air underneath this truck i have no idea why it must be for an aero reason the fact that if you were to export this vehicle to europe look at where the reverse lights are your euro plate's going to cover all of that right there so you'd have to do a reverse light um replacement of some kind or never tow with it and put your euro plate here i guess could be an option all these interesting things things like what the turn signals and brake lights look like in person the rear camera mounts so much more i want to get into with this truck and thankfully we got a head start filming through the middle of the night tonight and we'll be working with it all week i can't thank enough everyone who's helped us with this project of course ben the owner of this truck for letting us use it for you guys to see again his stuff will be linked in the description below truly an awesome guy to just say take the truck do what you need to do with it really appreciate that of course brandon flash for helping me figure out the charging issues jeremy whaling who you guys have seen on the ev go uh podcast we were just nerding out about why we couldn't get this thing to ccs charge and we have some ideas about trying a thousand volt capable nax cables and even going to some lower voltage chargers so much to dig into on all of these topics and um yeah truly it's been uh so many people involved from uh, Brandon Tesla Flex coming down here. We'll have five cyber trucks on Thursday all in one place. It's going to be crazy. We have Colton coming down, Drew from Martian Wheels, who will be making Martian Wheels for the cyber truck. I can't wait to see what those look like because so many people hate the wheel covers and we need a really cool, aggressive wheel for this thing. Um, it's just all coming together. It's been so cool. And of course, Francie for filming. Thank you very much. For, <laughs> I just saw the look on her face. <laughs> you just held that camera for two hours <laughs> while I rambled on <laughs> about this truck. So I can't thank you enough. Normally that's Alyssa behind the camera, but she's got that incredible arm strength. You're using some cool uh, contraption here. Yeah. What is that thing? It's called a tripod. <laughs> a tripod. That's a little tiny one, it but a little somehow one. that's easier for you to hold than a normal Not phone. so much shoulder work. And there's just so much to dig into over the next coming days. It's uh, truly incredible what we have to do. And and to thanks to everyone, my friend Skyler and and really everyone who's helping us, uh, my friend Matt with a lightning. We So many people involved with getting the, the uh, Cybertruck coverage out from our side. And it's all happening last minute on the fly. Who knows what we're able to get? And we almost just lost this whole video. So, <laughs> you know, it's all part of the fun. Plenty of videos to come. Please comment with what you want to see. We'll put it all in a full video. Plenty of range testing, charging testing, towing testing, off-road testing. Ugh. I don't think we're going to sleep very much, and I'm already tired. See you on another one again soon. Bye-bye. You know, we are talking about a metal electric truck that I'm, you know, complaining about charging speeds and towing stuff and trying to really evaluate the nerd portion of it. But we all know, like, 99% of these things are going to end up right over there at Whole Foods and uh, no one's going to give a crap about steer by wire or any of the other stuff. It's too bad though because truck's pretty cool. Pretty cool. No one's going to care. <laughs>